we are going to have a few words about our dear friend Don Warner and Pastor Matt has agreed to come up first to say a few things. Thanks, Pastor. Well, first of all, welcome. We're uh, very glad to have you here at Grace Lutheran Church. I'm sure that uh, many of you heard that uh, Don Warner passed away this past week. Don was a member of Grace Lutheran Church. He was really active in our outreach ministry. He uh, uh, helped uh, to plan dinners and to put on events and to bring in speakers. And he's uh, the person who, who uh, got us started selling uh, equal exchange and fair trade products uh, down in our coffee shop. And so we really, really remember and appreciate Don for that. Uh, Donna also, of course, was a member of the Historical Society. This organization was really important to him. So the connection here uh, between us uh, was exemplified by this good man here, and we're, we're sorry that he's gone, and we celebrate and uh, remember his life and his work both at Grace Lutheran Church and with the Historical Society. So thanks for being here today. And, uh, yeah. Frank Badovic is also going to say a few words for us. Thank you, Jason. It's uh, good to see all those faces out there. But our numbers were fewer by one by Don Warner. He was a regular attendee at all the BLTs, and he and I would have a chance to chat. Uh, you probably know Don if you're a Carra County Times subscriber from all the historical photographs he used to place in the newspaper up until quite recently. And there'd be a great photo from New Windsor or Union Bridge or wherever else, and it would say from the Don Warner collection, which I always thought was pretty cool. He also collected uh, political memorabilia, uh, campaign buttons, uh, banners, posters, things of that sort. He loved history, and he was a pillar of the community, not just the historical society, but I was amazed at all the things he belonged to. Oh, he was the son of the American Revolution, pretty impressive. Uh, also the Elks, the JCs, and the Rotary. And he was a, a, an officer in many of those. Um, he died suddenly on February 12th in Manchester. He survived by his daughter, uh, Cindy Kirk, husband and nieces and nephews. Um, it was lovely that the family has asked that in lieu of flowers to donate to the Historical Society of Carroll County. And what we've decided to do is to plant a tree in Don's honor, honor out back in our gardens, and we hope it grows to robust quality and, and has a long life just like Don did. So thanks for your attention, and hold Don in your prayers. Thank you, Pastor Matt and Frank, uh, for those words. Um, just an FYI, Frank Badovic's talk from last month is on the Society's homepage. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, there is a watch this video link. It'll pop up and you can see the latest BLT talks there. So check that out when you have a moment. We want to acknowledge our sponsor for today's talk, Axe Fairhaven. Kevin Jones in the back. You can wave Kevin, say hi to everyone. Uh, yeah, can we have a round of applause for our sponsor? Thank you, Kevin. Axe Fairhaven is a continuous care retirement community located on a beautiful 300-acre wooded campus in Sykesville, Maryland, within minutes from shopping, restaurants, and golf. Axe is the ideal choice for seniors seeking an active retirement lifestyle that offers security and value. To fit your individual goals, preferences, and budget, Fairhaven offers a variety of affordable financial options that are, are designed to accommodate your income, asset, and insurance situation. And without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Diane. Diane Fetcher is a retired U.S. Navy captain who has pursued, pursued her fa own family tree for the last three decades. She learned to clean headstones focusing on forgotten veterans, headstones and private cemeteries. Diane became involved with the restoration of Ellsworth Cemetery after relocating to Maryland during 2020. She works for Microsoft as a chief of staff and is the current president of the Carroll County Genealogical Society. Diane, are you ready to go? 
Great. Can we have a round of applause for them? Thank you. So good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm always excited to share what we know about Ellsworth Cemetery and the people there. Um, so I'm really grateful that you came to listen to me because it stops me from randomly grabbing people in grocery stores <laughs> and saying, let me tell you about this wonderful story. So um, we're going to focus on the autobiography of John Baptiste Snowden who uh, was a resident, longtime resident of Westminster and Carroll County and is buried up at Ellsworth. Um, there we go. So this is um, a picture of Reverend Snowden from his autobiography and his memorial, which is the largest in Ellsworth Cemetery. Um, so we know a lot about his life as well as his, his family. From, from the autobiography, which he wrote in, we think in the 1860s and 1870, in 1870s, it wasn't published until 1900 when his son added a few chapters and then published it in 1900. We know that his grandmother, she went by Sarah, but she, her full name is recorded as Sarah Minty Baraki. We know that she was born in Africa. Um, we believe she was born in a, a part of Africa called Guinea, but as you see from this map that came from about the, the mid-1700s, that was a really large part of Africa. And I've superimposed um, the map of the United States in the lo lower left-hand corner to give you an idea of the scale that we're talking about, the area that she came from. Um, we know that she arrived in Maryland in 67 or 68. We know that she gave birth on the waters. So while she was in the Middle Passage, she gave birth to uh, the Reverend's Aunt Jane. And um, then she came to Maryland. Uh, she wouldn't eat pork, which makes me think that she might have been Muslim. Um, there is a tribe called the Fula tribe that is primarily, even today, about 95% Muslim and lives in that area. So with no other <laughs> thing to go on, um, that's my best guess, is that she was a member of that tribe. Uh, she remembers having uh, gold earrings, um, holes in, uh, three to four holes in each ear to hold her jewelry. So she came from a wealthy family. Um, based on the Slave Voyages database, we have narrowed down two voyages, voyages that may have been her trip to the, uh, Maryland. There were a lot of other ships that came to, um, that made the passage in the 1760s. However, most of them did not come to Maryland. They came uh, to the Caribbean or to the Deep South. So these two ships came to Maryland. And you can see they were relatively small ships, about 100 um, enslaved people on each one. The Lord Ligonier you may have heard of before. Alex Haley believes that his ancestor, Kunta Kinte, came over on the Lord Ligonier. And we do know that based on this, um, this advertisement, that they were looking for tobacco and to, sell, uh, to sell the enslaved people for tobacco. And we know that that's what happened. Nicholas Hardin, who purchased uh, Sarah Baraki, did so with some hogshead of tobacco. So we've narrowed it down, and it's probably better than even money that she came over on the Lord Ligonier. She lived with and married in all but law a white na man named Thomas Collier. Um, we have found him in the Queen Anne's census in 1790, so a few years after he would have been living with her. This is uh, Reverend Snowden's grandfather. He talks about how they were together in all but um, law because, of course, Maryland was one of the first states to outlaw interracial marriage, and it remained illegal until the Loving decision in the 1960s. Um, so, and we found him again in uh, Fredericktown, so he did move to this area. He never purchased her um, that we can find, um, and we don't know why. Uh, it could be he could not afford to have done so. It could be that her enslaver wasn't interested in selling. Um, we, it's impossible to know 200 years later what was going on with that. But we do know that um, this was the, the Reverend's grandfather. 
um, on the maternal side, his mother, Fanny. Um, his father was a man named Nathan Snowden. Uh, one of the things that we see when we're looking through African American history and, and genealogy in Maryland is that unlike the Deep South, the enslaved people did not typically take on the last names of their enslavers. So we don't know where the Snowden name come, came from. I get this question a lot, and I'm sorry, I don't know. We know that Nathan Snowden was his father. He lived seven miles from his wife and children, and he walked that seven miles every night to see them and be with them, and then walked it back the next morning to go to work. Um, and so uh, obviously a very loving and devoted father. His father, we know very little about, just that his name was John Snowden. We haven't been able to find anything more about the two gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is sh uh, share with you a little bit more about, oh, there's Nathan. Um, oh, and he was um, enslaved by a man named Eli Dorsey. We, I found two Eli Dorseys that I can't narrow down which one it was. I've looked at their wills. I can't find any reference to the Snowden family. So I'm not sure um, who, um, uh, who, who he was enslaved by. Um, the children would be the property of the mother's enslaver rather than the father's enslaver. So the children, based on a 1644 law, the children would inherit the condition of their mother, not their father, and be owned by whoever enslaved the mother, not the father. So, um, so now I'm going to shift and tell you a little bit more about uh, Reverend Snowden himself. He was born in 1801 in Anne Arundel. He was enslaved because his mother was. And um, he records five enslavers through his life. He, when he was a teenager, well, he was sold away from his mother's enslaver or it possibly was inherited um, when he was about six or seven years old. So it had to be taken away from his mother as a, as a very young boy and um, only learned about her death uh, through somebody else. Um, when he was a young teenager, he converted to Methodism. He would have been Catholic before. We know that, um, uh, again, enslaved people typically were raised in the faith of their enslavers, and so we know that the Hardens were Catholic, and, but he converted to Methodism. And uh, much to the chagrin of his mistress, who tried to torture the religion out of him. Um, the way she, he describes it is, uh, he said that he was, he was um, after his conversion, he, uh, he says, my mistress, who we think is a woman named uh, Mary Bennett, um, my mistress was a very wicked woman, did everything she could to torment me and make me give up my religion. She cursed me violently and gave me three weeks to hold on. Finding that she could not drive me from the right way by cursing and threats, she took to the covering from my bed, saying she would freeze the religion from me. But none of these things moved me from the heavenly road. I tried to obey and please my mistress as far as I could, but when serving the Lord was displeasing to her, I chose rather to please and obey God than her. And so he um, later on convinced his... Um, it, he, he went through two more enslavers and um, became a minister while he was still enslaved, which was pretty unusual. It was unusual in the first place for an African American to become a minister and to have uh, that um, uh, trust placed in him while he was still enslaved was even more unusual. Uh, black preachers were not allowed to preach without a white preacher present, and so he would always have um, a white minister with him. Um, he w was able to convince his um, enslaver to allow him to purchase his own freedom, which he did, and then decided that he was going to um, marry a free woman because he did not want to add to the, um, the evil of slavery by having enslaved children. Um, so he, he, he says this about it. I regarded slaveholding a great crime, one that man should give an account of in the day of judgment. After a careful study of the subject, I concluded that all men ought to be free, and all good men should work to accomplish that end. I resolved within my own self that I would never increase slavery by any act of mine. So he, at the time he was still enslaved, he also learned to read and write. 
he taught himself and hid it from his master and mistress. Um, he actually um, raised enough money for his what they called Sunday money. So the work that he did on Sunday would be um, things that he could keep his own money. And he bought a spelling book um, by convincing some of the uh, white children in the neighborhood to take his money and buy him a spelling book. And so he was able to have that. And then he, um, he also, he said, I, he, he hired a woman for a dollar to teach him to read and write. And he says this about it. I have spent a good many dollars since that school period and have tried to do so to the best advantage. But I think that no dollar I ever invested has brought forth as good of results as the one paid to Mrs. Lynch for teaching me. So he moved to Westminster and he married Margaret Kuhn. We'll talk about her in just a minute. He wanted to move to Pennsylvania. He thought Pennsylvania was the place for him. Maryland obviously still a slave state at this time in the 1830s and um, Pennsylvania was gradually um, uh, moving slavery out. And so he wanted to move to Pennsylvania, but his wife didn't. And so keeping in mind that this, he's speaking to us from about 170 years ago, he says, when the wife is not willing to go where her husband wants to go, the only way to remain together in peace is to stay where she wants to stay. <laughs> he's a wise man, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, and, and Margaret was an amazing woman. Uh, she was born enslaved. She spoke, um, I, I'll get to a little bit about her, but I do want to share with you what he said that she did when she would make their clothing from scratch, except for their hats and their shoes. And what she, he, she would do to make clothing from scratch in the 1800s, she could shear the sheep, card the wool, spin the yarn, and knit the socks. She could plow the ground, sow the flax seed, pull the flax, thresh it, put it out to rot, break the flax, and spin it. So being a housewife in the 1800s involved quite a bit. Uh, she was also, uh, we know that she took care of a lot of the other women in the neighborhood. She probably practiced midwifery and um, did a lot for, um, uh, had a lot of medical knowledge. And um, Reverend Snowden has something to say about that. He says, the slave mothers and fathers had a great deal of good medicinal knowledge, much more than the present generation has. So just, just like today, you know, kids these days, they don't know how to do these things. Um, no doubt this came from the fact that many of the slaves had to be their own doctors in most cases. Necessity compelled them to study the use of herbs or roots to effect cures. And he goes on to suggest that people, that the rich who have money to, to burn can, can share it with doctors, but the poor people should take care of themselves. So now let me tell you a little bit more about Mrs. Snowden. Uh, she was born Margaret Kuhn. She was enslaved by a woman named Regina Grand Adams, who was a German Catholic. And um, she was manumitted upon uh, Mrs. Grand Adams' death. Uh, so manumitted is the legal word from being set free from slavery forever. So we get this picture from his autobiography again. And um, she was known as Aunt Peggy. Uh, this is her obituary, um, and she was fluent not only in English, but also in German and Pennsylvania Dutch. And their neighbors, their German and, and Pennsylvania and Dutch neighbors, delighted in talking with her uh, because she was fluent. She also uh, did a lot of math in her head. She would go to Baltimore uh, fairly often to buy and sell goods for their neighbors. And we can see in, this is uh, Regina's will, so Regina frees both Peggy, she goes by Peggy in the will, and her mother Elizabeth. She also wills that they have um, interest from some funds that she had put in the bank, as well as some land. And that after their deaths, this land and the money would go to the Catholic Church. Um, I have been told, and I don't have the, the evidence of it, but I have reached, I've actually talked with one of the descendants of Mrs. Grand Adams, Reverend Snowden thought she died alone, didn't have any family, but that wasn't the case. Um, maybe she just didn't like them, we don't know. But she didn't will them her estate. She willed her estate to um, the two enslaved people that she set free for their use while they were living, and then to go to the Catholic Church. 
Um, what I have learned since is that the Catholic Church decided not to wait and actually um, went after the land early and, and um, uh, obtained it prior to it. Because I've actually also spoken to the descendant of one of the lawyers involved in that case. Um, so uh, there was, a, and they own the land to this day. They were always intended to have the land. I want to be clear that they were, it was always intended that they would have it, but um, it was supposed to be for the use of um, Mrs. Uh, Snowden and her mother while they were living. So both um, Reverend and Mrs. Snowden believed in education. So they're raising their children. They had 14 children, uh, four died in infancy, 10 lived to be um, older, two died as teenagers. And so eight of the 14 lived to be adults. Um, they all learned to read and write. Um, all, all but one went to school. And what we know, what happened with them, so just a little, little bit of tidbit of, of the legacy of the Snowdens. So John M. Snowden, who is also buried as Ellsworth, was the first black man to serve on a jury in Carroll County. His brother, Tom Baptiste Snowden, who was the author of the, um, of the autobiography that he added to it and got it published, he was a, a Methodist minister. And their sister, Mary, I'll tell you a little bit more about her, she became an educator. And following the Civil War, set up schools in, for free blacks, with the recently free blacks in South Carolina and in Texas. Um, so, oh, and there, and then the next generation, we've got Perry Walker, who's Mary's son. He was a doctor and went to Howard Medical School. At the time, Howard Medical School was only a night school because none of the students could afford to not work. So everybody worked during the day and went to classes at night. He became a medical doctor and um, served during the Spanish-American War. Uh, he was not allowed to be a surgeon in the army, though, and he served as a hospital steward. Um, one of his other cousins, uh, James Snowden, went to Alabama and became an instructor at the infamous Tuskegee Institute. And then an, another child, uh, a great grandchild, uh, became a bishop. Uh, so quite the legacy of one man who, with his Sunday money, bought his own freedom and raised his children here in Carroll County. So let me shift. I'm going to talk with um, talk about some of the other folks. But I can pause here and ask for questions if anybody has questions specifically about the Snowden family. Do we know where they lived specifically? Uh, the question is, do we know what, where they lived specifically? They, um, they lived in town for a little while. We don't know where. Um, but he does tell us in the book that he felt that town was not a place to raise children. So the bustling <laughs> metropolis of Westminster in 1850, he thought was, was too much for his kids. And so they did live on some farmland. And we don't know where. Um, they did not own land. We know that. Yes, ma'am. So John M. Snowden, right, who actually did very well for himself. He raised pigs, he, yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you talking about the Snowdens or are you talking about the Bruce's? John Snowden, okay, okay, great. Yes. So, Post the Civil War, yeah, then African Americans were permitted to own property in Maryland. Prior to that, it was unusual, and in fact, um, often required an act of the state legislature. If you go back and you look at the archives of the state legislature, you'll see several occasions where they permit free colored, that's the language they use, free black people to own land. And it required an act of the legislature in order to allow that to happen. So, but John Snowden, you said, you, you believe, you, based on the research you've done, well, we need to get together, we need to talk. Yeah, this is his son, and then, yeah, when he was older. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, so one of the questions I get a lot about Ellsworth is, do we have uh, Civil War veterans? And yes, we have 17 Civil War veterans that we believe are buried in Ellsworth Cemetery. Um, they were um, almost evenly split, enslaved, and free prior to the Civil War. Um, 
Let me tell you a little bit about the history of the USCT. So prior to the Militia Act of 1862, African-American men were not permitted to serve in the US Army. We do see some in the Navy, and we do see some instances of people in the War of 1812, but it's unusual. Um, so the Militia Act of 1862 opens up service for African-American men, men only. Um, and then the following spring, the Army establishes the Bureau of Colored Troops specifically to raise regiments of African-Americans, both free and, and previously enslaved um, uh, men to serve. Ultimately, about 175 regiments were formed under the USCT, uh, comprising about 10% of the United States Army during the Civil War. Um, what else do we have? Oh, this, this picture is probably the most used picture when you see articles about the USCT, right? And one of the reasons is the expression on the men's faces. They're, they're so determined, they're so um, just resolute. And this is the fourth USCT, which was formed here in Carroll County and in Baltimore. And this is one of the companies. Now it's a dream of mine to be able to put names to the faces. I haven't been able to do that yet, nor have I been able to spot that this absolutely is a Carroll Countonian in this picture, but they likely are some men from Carroll County in this picture. So whenever you see it, when you see anything about the USCT, they often use this picture, and this is from our, our area. Um, so John Cole, you may have seen this picture before. This is a great picture of John Wesley B. Cole. He served in um, the, the Civil War. He was wounded three times. Uh, this great picture was donated by the Cole Frisbee family to the Historical Society. And um, again, I just, just love, the, love the distinguished man that we see um, standing here. Um, his grave had been unmarked for about 120 years, and it was among those that we got marked at Ellsworth Cemetery over, um, last summer. So we applied to the Veterans Affairs, Department of Veterans Affairs, and they issued these um, headstones. And I know some of you were out there that day, that probably the hottest day of the summer, uh, putting, putting the stones in. So it was, it was a hot day, um, but uh, his, his um, grave is now marked. And this is um, a, a note from his pension record. And one of the things to apply for a pension at a certain time, they had to prove that they had a disability as a result of the war. And so he, it, and one of the questions is, is, when did you go to the hospital? And he says here, I didn't go to the hospital because when I was wounded at Petersburg, so the Battle of Petersburg under General Butler, when I was wounded at Petersburg, they, they told me to go to the hospital, but I told the captain that as long as I could shoulder a musket, I would stay with the company. And he was permitted to do so and treated by the regimental surgeon and remained on the line and fighting in that battle. Um, one of his wounds was a bayonet wound, which I'm pretty sure was friendly fire. Once he got into bayonet warfare, there weren't a lot of survivors for that. So we think that may have been what happened, but um, that was uh, John Wesley Cole's, uh, just evidence of his courage and bravery. Um, another one of our folks, uh, I love this story, <laughs> is Daniel Warfield. So Daniel served, uh, Mr. Warfield, Private Warfield, served as a drummer boy. So his father, Oscar Warfield, bound him out when he was a young boy. Not an uncommon practice to bound out young children to other, to farmers, and then their pay would go to the parent, the father. So Oscar bound out young Daniel. He apparently did not care for that situation and ran away up to Pennsylvania. Now, in his pension record, he said he was about 9 or 10, which is quite a feat for a young boy that age. Um, he claimed to be 17. You can see on the far left on his Army record, he said he was 17 years old. He was 4 foot 11. Um, and the, you can just imagine the recruiter going, 17, huh? Okay. <laughs> and writing down that he was 17. So, um, let me, oh, there we are. Yeah, so there it is. Thank you. Um, so we've got, um, he, he ran north um, to Pennsylvania, and we do know he enlisted. Whether he was 9, 10, 15, 17, we don't know. But he did serve with the Pennsylvania Regiment. 
um, during the Civil War and returned back to Westminster where he opened a barber shop with his two sons. His father, Oscar, apparently, yes, this is, this is his, his headstone, um, and what you see up on the screen is an excerpt from Oscar Warfield's will. And what he says is, is that my estate is to be divided amongst my, all my sons and daughters, share and share alike, except for Daniel. Who gets one dollar? <laughs> so we know Oscar could hold a grudge. <laughs> we don't know what else had happened between the two men, um, but it, it wasn't uncommon if somebody wanted to write somebody out of a will to leave them a dollar because otherwise the, um, the person could claim that they were forgotten about and that they were intended to uh, receive more. But by willing him a dollar, he made it very clear that that was all Daniel was going to be entitled for. And Daniel actually died of influenza during the, um, the Spanish flu outbreak, during the, the great epidemic. So talk about um, moving forward in time a little bit, some of our World War I veterans. So we have a number of World War I veterans. The army at this point was still segregated and the African-American men served in the 92nd, I think the 92nd and the 93rd divisions. And when they were going over to Europe, while Pershing kept the um, white American soldiers under American command, the African-American soldiers went under French command. They were issued French kit, um, so French uniforms, French rifles, so they had to retrain on the French equipment. Um, Harvey Gibson, who's buried up at Ellsworth, and we don't know exactly where his grave is, um, so that's why his headstone is up by the flag circle. Uh, we hope to learn where he is, but that's where he is, his headstone is now. So Harvey Gibson served in Company C of the 371st, and this company is notable for having the first African American to receive a Medal of Honor for World War I. So Freddie Stowers was a corporal, and they were taking a hill, and they were uh, the, uh, obviously World War I, we're talking trench warfare. So the Germans are coming out of their trench as if to surrender. And so the companies moving forward across no man's land when the Germans jump back into their trench and open fire, withering fire that kills about half of the people, including all of the officers. Corporal Stowers presses the attack takes out one machine gun nest and then charges against another and is killed in that second attack. He did not receive his Medal of Honor right away. Unfortunately, it was misplaced and it wasn't until the 1970s when the Army said, this is kind of strange. Not a single African-American soldier received a Medal of Honor during, for their actions in World War I. Maybe we should take a look at this and see if we missed something. And they did, and they found Corporal Stowers' um, award submission, and he was the first um, African American to receive the Medal of Honor for actions in World War I. Um, it was given to his sisters, because obviously he, he died in the attack. Um, we have a few more other World War I veterans in the cemetery, some of whom were still working to meet all of the requirements of the Veterans Affairs. To, in order to secure headstones for. So Arthur Squirrel and Thomas Bruce were still working to secure headstones for them. But we know that they served and we know that they are buried at Ellsworth. We have a couple of World War II veterans, um, Leon Smith and James Gibson, who served during the Army, um, and I believe James Gibson was in the Air Corps. So I've been talking a lot about men because I've been talking about veterans and you know, back then um, only the men served. So I wanted to share with you a few of the stories of the notable women who are um, part of this community, if you will. So probably the most unique headstone that we have is for Laura Robinson. Laura Robinson was a domestic. She worked um, for uh, various families, but um, when she passed away, she was working for um, a judge. Um, this kind of a headstone is called a ledger. So it's about the size of the grave. It's about eight feet long, about three, four feet wide. Um, and in her will, she says, I want an appropriate headstone. And so I think they did okay um, in creating that one for her. Um, and then I mentioned before Mary Walker. We do have a picture of Mary Snowden. So this is uh, Reverend Snowden's second daughter. She married uh, Perry G. Walker, who was a minister. 
We believe he was a freeborn black man from uh, Liberty Town. And uh, he became a bishop as well, or excuse me, a very significant minister. He never actually rose to the bishop. Um, but she was such a well-known educator that after the Civil War, she went down to South Carolina, helped establish some schools. And then the um, university that you see here, the St. Phillips College, which is um, still a, a HBCU in San Antonio, Texas, rode off to Baltimore where she was living with her husband and had her come all the way down to Texas to run the school for two years. We also have Eliza Franklin. Um, Eliza was the wife of Alan Franklin, who was a USCT uh, soldier. He was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic, which in itself was not a segregated organization. The post could decide whether to be integrated or not. Um, those in Carroll County were segregated, so the one here in Westminster was the Burns Post, was an all-white post. The African Americans attended the Thaddeus Stevens Post. And we know that Eliza Franklin was the president of the Women's Relief Corps, which was the women's auxiliary of the Grand Army of the Republic. And as an organization that remains to this day. So they did uh, community work, so they raised funds to take care of veterans, to take care of schools, to take care of the others in their community. And then Jane Thompson is our earliest burial. So she died in 1862, which actually predates the founding of the Ellsworth Cemetery Corporation. Um, and she was, we the earliest we find her in the records is in 1830. So in the 1830 census, she's enumerated as a free black woman with her daughters, which is um, unusual, as you might imagine. Um, her husband, Samuel, who is buried with her, was likely enslaved, or else he would have been listed as the head of household. So by 1850, though, they're both free and they're living um, with their granddaughter, Clementine, who married one of the Snowden boys, which actually I think is a nephew of the Reverend rather than a, a straight line descendant. Okay. Kind of wrapping it up here, one of the questions I get a lot about is, what do you need at Ellsworth? And most people think we need money. And of course we do, we're a nonprofit. <laughs> like, of course we need money. Um, but what we need even more is information. So things about like, where do people live? What, and to some extent, where are they buried? So we're looking to um, tap into the wisdom, uh, you know, people who have lived here for a long time who may know more about um, the history of the cemetery, please reach out. Um, I would love to talk with you about what you may know um, to advance the, um, our knowledge about this critical part of the county's history. And with that, I'll open it up more generally for questions. I have a microphone here. If someone raises their hand, I can hand it to you. The uh, last woman you were describing there, you said she died before the cemetery was created. Do you know where she was buried in the interim between her death and when Ellsworth was created? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I, I suspect the land was actually being used as a cemetery for free blacks before the incorporation of the cemetery. So I think she was buried there and then the, the monument was um, erected after her husband passed away. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, so I, I am a veteran myself, and so one of my COVID projects, one of my pandemic projects was helping to clean the headstones. And when I read about Ellsworth Cemetery, um, I started, I, I, there was only four veteran headstones up there. And it struck me that that was probably not enough. And so I started digging into it. And then honestly, how can you not be? pulled in by these stories. I, it's just, to me, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think we have 
I mean, there's another, Clarissa is right here. This is Private Dorsey, right? And he was actually enslaved before he, he joined the military. So he joins the army to, to get out of enslavement. Sergeant Ephraim Smith, he's our senior. Uh, he's, he's the most senior veteran we have in the cemetery because he was older, he was like 32 when he enlisted. Um, you can imagine their lives and you know how difficult they must have been at a time when they couldn't vote or even be citizens, right? Um, and, and yet, when the war came, they said, yeah, I will go. And just, that's inspiring to me. And, um, and, and also, it's, I really believe that this is our shared history. So one of the things I, I think a lot about is, I'm, I am a white woman, and I'm spending a lot of time researching an African-American cemetery. And so, so why? Well, it's because it's our history. It's not part of, it's not somebody else's history. It, this is American history. And I've learned so much about um, the county, about Maryland, um, some things that I didn't know. Like, for example, Louis Dorsey, because he was enslaved, his enslavers got paid by the federal government. The U.S. Army, and you can think of it as the U.S. Army bought him if he wanted, I guess. I don't know. I, it, but they called it a, they called it a bounty. You could call it reparations. A free man enlisting got $100, but an enslaved man enlisting, his enslavers got $300. And it just got, wow, yeah, exactly. Like, it's crazy, right? And they had to, um, they had a proof title. They had to sign a loyalty oath to the United States, which one, and I forget who it was, but one, one what I found, the, the gentleman signed the loyalty oath, and then apparently somebody contested his loyalty to the United States because he wrote another letter saying, I don't know why people are saying that I'm a secessionist. I'm not, and I deserve my $300. So, I mean, like, things I never knew about, and it never, never occurred to me to even ask about, like, what happened here. And, um, yeah, like I said, that's... I, hopefully this inspires others to see this as, our, again, our shared history. So. Anyone else out here? Here we go. Um, you haven't told us, and I'm curious, as to why Ellsworth Cemetery was established and why was it established at the location that it was? So great question. And so Jan, this is the time I'd like you, if you could take us to slide 50. I thought I might get this question. I don't have a solid answer, right? I can tell you what I do now, right? So what we know is that um, Ellsworth Cemetery Corporation was established in 1876 by seven prominent African-American men who were members of the Westminster community. Um, these men also served on the school board. They were, you know, wealthy, uh, relatively um, uh, men who were taking care of their community. So if you're on the Reisterstown Road, if you're on 140 heading to Reisterstown and the Wawa's on your left, the cemetery is up behind that. That's where it is. And it is about three miles from the Union Street Church, which was the main church that the people who were buried there went to. So why is it there? So I know that there is some, I don't know, folklore that says black people weren't allowed to be buried in, El in uh, the city limits. I haven't found any documentation that specifically says that, right? So there isn't any specific law that says it's, that's the case. Peggy's mom, Elizabeth Kuhn, is buried in St. John which is the Catholic cemetery, because again, her enslavers were Catholic, and so she would have been Catholic, and that's where she's buried, which everybody knows is inside the city limits of Westminster, and she was a free, free black woman when she died. So apparently, black people, free black people could be buried within the city limits, or at least the Catholic Church decided that they would do it, right? But at the same time, when, when the cemetery was established, the land that was sold to them was outside of the city. And, we know that, um, so interesting, so American history, and this is where I get just completely wrapped in it, right? So I go looking for like, well, why would that be the case? And so in 1953, so right now we're like 75 years after the establishment of Ellsworth, racial covenants in cemeteries are still legal in the United States. 
And this is a court case where it was a Native American soldier from the Korean War who was KIA, and his family wanted him buried in what was a predominantly white cemetery in Sioux City, Iowa. And the cemetery said, absolutely not, not for a Native American. You're not allowed to be buried here. His family took him to court, and the cemetery won. And what they found was like 95% of cemeteries across the United States, not north or south, but across the United States, were segregated. And that remained to be the law of the land until the Vietnam War. And John Terry was KIA. Corporal Terry, before he went off to war, told his family, when I, if I die in Vietnam, I want to be buried in Elmwood. And his family were like, that's funny. Everybody knows Elmwood's a white cemetery. You can't be buried there. But he said it again and again, and he actually wrote his mother home and said, this is where I want to be buried. So when he was killed in Vietnam and came back to the United States, his family bought, applied to buy a plot in Elmwood Cemetery, and they were refused, and they took him to court. He was buried somewhere else. They won the court case. He was disinterred and reinterred in Elmwood, and it is now the law of the land that we cannot have segregation in cemeteries. So that's probably a really long answer to your question, and it doesn't actually get to the heart of it, maybe, but it probably was because most cemeteries were segregated by race at the time. And that was, that was what everybody was going to be used to, and that was what was going to happen. Yes, sir? Thanks so much, uh, for Terry. Those of us at the meeting, speaking for myself, had never heard of it. Mm. And so we lit up to that, decided to pursue that, and our Rotary Club has been involved in service projects at the cemetery, yeah. including staining the wooden fences, yep. digging out the weeds around the flag court. We donated a new base and a new flag pole for mm -hmm. the flag court, and we're planning to pursue those kind of projects again in the spring. So if somebody's looking for hands-on as well as donating, it's the Rotary Club of Bob's Meadow. We are a morning club, and you can find us on Facebook. Yeah, thank you so much for your support. I have been honestly deeply humbled that every time we ask for help and volunteers, the response of the community to, to really own, own the cemetery and take care of it. So thank you for all that work. I see somebody's hand over here. No? What else? Diane, before we uh, hand the microphone over to Kevin, can you speak a little bit about the table back here? And oh, the setup? absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate the response, the, the call out. Um, yes. So the um, the Snowden autobiography I did find online. Um, it was published in 1900 and therefore out of copyright. So I took it and I've annotated it because um, I don't know how big a hogshead of tobacco is. And so um, for a modern audience, um, I, it, there's quite a few notations. I've also added an appendix that includes um, the children, information about the children and the grandchildren of Reverend Snowden and Mrs. Snowden. We don't sell the book. Nobody associated with the cemetery get, make any profit or any money from the cemetery. We're all unpaid volunteers. The book is available. I have a few copies um, at the table in the back. Um, we recommend a suggested donation of $20 to the cemetery for the book, but again, it's not for sale. We're not making profit from it. So hopefully. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.